and the anointing of the incarnate son. Now, why is that so important? Well, because this epiphany, this manifestation marks the beginning of Christ's early ministry. This is what it points to. How do we know this? Well, we know, do you know what happens next? According to Luke's gospel, shortly after Jesus' baptism, he goes to the synagogue there, there's a bunch of scribes and Pharisees. They're reading through the Torah. And it comes to the part of the scroll of Isaiah. And they ask Jesus to read the scripture. Or he just steps up and does it without invitation. Yeah. We don't really know. He proclaimed in the synagogue against the scribes and Pharisees and the rulers and those who were listening. He said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. You see that picture? The spirit of the Lord, because he has anointed me to proclaim news to the poor. Good news. Hallelujah. What is it? He sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners to recover the sight of the blind Amen. to set the oppressed free and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Amen. Jesus began his ministry on earth with the blessing and affirmation of the Father and with it he brought to us hope. He had come to proclaim the good news. He brought healing, sight to the blind. He brought redemption, freedom from the prisoner. He brought blessings and lives and gifts and love and fulfillment and affirmation and destiny and purpose for all of us here. Amen. We should first note, of course, that Jesus really, and I, I need to say this, this is the Baptist coming out in me. <laughs> I invite you to come on Wednesday mornings. A little bit of Catholic or Catholicism comes out in me every now and then. I enjoy it. Uh, but I, I, I simply need to say that Jesus didn't have a need to be baptized. But though he was fully human, sharing in our woes of suffering, he had no sin. He was not born with original sin. He had no sin nature like us. There was no need for him to repent. Uh, yet for our sake, he humbles himself. This is the Baptist part of me. To the outward act of John's baptism in the Jordan River, one which John proclaimed to the people for the, the forgiveness of sins. Uh, and in doing so, in submitting himself to this outward act, Jesus did two things. First, he gave us who are indeed sinful, an example in which we can follow. Good Baptist definition. Glory, glory to God. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Turn from your sins, repent, and return to the Lord. That's the message. In submitting to the baptism, Jesus is telling us that John had it right. We need to listen to what he said. And secondly, and perhaps more profoundly, by submitting to the act of baptism, Jesus firmly confirmed the nearness of the kingdom of God. But now, he said, the time has come. The kingdom of God. And in doing so, in submitting to the baptism of John, Jesus firmly plants a flag. Much like the mascot of Florida State. You know his name? Osceola. Yeah. You know the name of his horse? Renegade. How many Florida State fans know that? There you go. And he runs, he comes in on his horse and he plants that flag. And, or the, I say that flag, but you know, it's a spear. And I think it's five or sometimes five. Yeah. 
It's an amazing thing. Just plan it. Make a statement. We're here. He does indeed. He does. And that's what Jesus did. He declares that the kingdom of God is now being established on earth. Hallelujah. I love it. It's so good. And with the establishment of the kingdom, Jesus leads the charge out of captivity to sin and out of the kingdom of death, out of the kingdom of darkness, into the kingdom of God's new life chosen in him. Hallelujah. Amen. Glory. This is the exciting part. It's life changing. Yes, it is. The life that we now have received in our baptism is a life that says we are no longer enslaved to sin. You may Amen. choose to sin, but you don't have to. That's right. Exactly. Glory. Glory. He set us free. We're no longer hopelessly and helplessly caught up in our failures of life, our sins, our transgressions, our mistakes. We are now established in this new life in Christ that Paul says that we have now, behold, all things have become new. Amen. The old way of relating has passed away and now there's eternal life in him. Theologically, that's what that means. But let's look at it practically. I want you to notice something. In Jesus' life and ministry, there are many times that Jesus wanted to get away from the crowd, to get away from the disciples, to get away from church folk. Now, I'm glad I've never felt that way. <laughs> but Jesus must have. Uh, just wanted to be alone to get away with the Father. And I get that. As a father, I get that. Some of the most precious and rememberable times in my life is when I would meet my oldest son and my youngest son, but more so my oldest because he had more opportunity to meet me at the lake and our place, we still have, but don't get to go and use that much. And my son would meet me there and we would just, father and son for a couple of days. And him a grown man, and I a grown man, would share life together. We would share our hopes and our dreams. We would share our concerns and our failures. We would fish and enjoy one another's presence. How precious it was. Jesus wanted that time with the Father. And it was such a notable feature of Jesus' life that Mark, Mark himself records it in chapter 1, verse 35. It says, in the morning, a great while before day, before the sun had come up, Jesus rose and he went out to a lonely place, a deserted place, and there he prayed to the Father. Now that's not an isolated event. The gospel records over and over again before and after big events in Jesus' life, like after feeding the 5,000 in Matthew, he wants to be with the Father after anointing and appointing the 12 apostles Jesus withdrew to the mountainside to be alone after he had confronted his enemies in John 6 before Peter's confession. And as Jesus turned his face to head towards Jerusalem, he went up into the mountainside and there to be alone to pray immediately before the transfiguration, before the teaching of the Lord's prayer to the disciples. And in John 17, the high priestly prayer of Jesus and the night in which he was to be crucified in the garden of Gethsemane. He prays to the Father just to name a few. Maybe he's tired and he needs strength and rest. Maybe he needed someone to talk things out to. Yeah. How many here have someone in their life that you can do that with? I hope everybody does. I, I, my, my wife uh, is 
a talker. I, I know you don't know that. <laughs> she likes to talk things out and sometimes over. Maybe he needed someone to talk things out. Maybe he needed to get away from the many demands and voices. You show out the name. Angel. Yes, yes. Angela. <laughs> Maybe he needed to renew his mission, to clarify his purpose. Maybe he just needed strength. Thank you, Jesus. Whatever the reasons, I can't help but to believe that he just wanted to hear his father say one more time, you are my son. And I love you. And I'm well pleased. Don't we all want to hear that? Yes. When we're tired and confused and we're hurting, when life has beat you down, when energy and strength and health is gone, how good is it to run to the arms of the Heavenly Father and to hear the Father say to you, my son or my daughter, I love you. Lord, I'm broken, and I'm hurting, and I need help, and I'm here, child. I love you. You're my son. You're my daughter. I died for you. That's precious. Jesus extends the invitation in Matthew 11. He says, come all unto me, those who are weary and heavy laden, I'll give you rest. We need peace for our soul. Life is hard. Don't we all want to hear the voice of God? And you can. You can. Yeah. You, did you know that you can? I love you. In John chapter 10, Jesus calls himself the good shepherd. And we are his sheep, his children, it says the sheep of his pastor. And in, our, in, in, in that key verse, Jesus confirms that we can hear his voice. He said, my sheep hear my voice. And they listen. Yes. Love it. They listen to my voice. I know them. And they follow me. Jesus doesn't tell us that we need to dig deeper. He doesn't tell us that we need to study longer. He doesn't suggest that we need to go to church more often. And then we'll be able to uncover the hidden mystery of hearing his voice. He doesn't say that at all. Instead, Jesus lists only one prerequisite for hearing his voice, and that is to be a sheep. As a child of God, we can learn to distinguish God's voice from the many others that are clamoring for our attention and our affection. We begin by understanding that we listen and speak to God because he wants to be in a relationship with us. He is our father and he interacts with us. He loves us. He wants you to love him. And there's no need to be afraid in the presence of the father. Amen. All aspects of God's character comes from love because God is love. And I say this in closing. God will never be rude or selfish or hateful. God will never speak to us in a manner that never, never will hurt us, but affirm us in a loving way. Instead, what we'll hear from the voice of God Instead, his voice will be patient. His voice will be 1 Corinthians 13. It will be kind. It won't be bragging or proudful or rude or self-seeking. Thank God it won't be easily angered. But it'll be merciful. Keeping no records of wrongs. You may keep them in your head. God will never keep them in his. Not delighting in evil, but rejoicing with truth. That is why I believe Jesus wanted to hear the voice of God over and over Amen. and over again. 
And so today I want to ask you to do something before you go to sleep. Everyone here. Everyone here. <laughs> what I want to ask you to do is that maybe even before you leave here if you happen to go to the restroom or you go to the hall where the water <coughs> fountain is located or if you're at home before you go to bed and you ladies take your makeup off at night give a little water this is baptism water left over because I haven't emptied it yet. Just get your fingers just a little wet. Put the sign of the cross on your forehead. Look at yourself in the mirror. Remember your baptism and be thankful. And listen to the voice of God say my daughter my son I love you and in you I'm well pleased Amen. that's the God you and I serve let us pray Holy Father, what a high and holy moment in the life of the church as we celebrate together the inauguration of the kingdom of God on earth, the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit made manifest for the whole world to see. The voice of the Father speaking to the Son and to us Amen. because it's our message. Yes. I love you. And I am well pleased. Amen. Peace. Thank you, Lord, Thank you. for the affirmation and the love that you pour into our lives. Amen. And I pray that every individual here today, before they go to bed, will do that very same thing. Remember your baptism. Remember the Son who died for your sin and the Holy Spirit that lives within you to empower you to live for Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. 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 Let's stand again. In Jesus. The altars are open and I can pray for you.
announcements. Uh, one of the greatest birthdays tomorrow will be celebrated. It's great because we close the office. Uh, it's really a great day. Martin Luther King, we yeah. celebrate. Uh, wonderful man. Uh, yes, he absolutely. The man used of God uh, to, to help set people free. But the office will be closed and praise the Lord for the celebration of his birthday. So just wanted to let you know. Um, uh, also, I think that's, that there's several things that are coming up, dates in the bulletin. Take your bulletin with you, put it on your calendar for sure. And uh, yeah, uh, if we don't have any other things. Prayer breakfast Saturday, 9 o'clock. Prayer breakfast for the ladies, uh, Saturday. Go in peace. The peace of God be with you. You are dismissed. <laughs>